Hi, I am Patrick Palm, CEO and founder of Favro, and this is the Learn From Leaders podcast. The background to these interviews is that Favro clients are some of the most innovative and agile businesses out there. And it's used for collaborative planning by marketing teams, by product teams, HR, management teams. And what this means is that we get to know some truly inspiring people. So what we do in this podcast is that I invite them here for conversation about something where they are true leaders. So we can all learn from it. Let's go. All right, and we are live with uh, Joe at uh, Timber Games. How's it going? Good morning. Hello. I'm great. Yeah. Thanks. So, okay. So first things first. So uh, sometimes I get um, ask questions around how to pronounce my name, which I think is very weird because it's just Patrick, but sometimes they want to do something with that C. So in your case, uh, is it is it Joe or Joey? It's Joe. Joe. Yeah. Okay, cool. And yes. does it yeah. ever happen that people get that wrong? Only when I'm in Europe. <laughs> yeah. See, that's why I'm asking the question because I'm here from Sweden. So yeah. I, and, yeah, I get, I get that in Europe. And then, of course, if I go to the UK, they forget to put the E on the name. So I'm just J-O. All right, I see. <laughs> well, um, we got plenty of people in um, in uh, uh, Vietnam and Lithuania. And you might imagine that um, the pronunciation of their family names are, are sometimes a bit of a challenge internally. But, you know, we're trying <laughs> our best, but it's not always going right. <laughs> so... Um, for the ones who um, who don't know you, why don't we talk um, a bit about your uh, your background? You know your your backstory, basically. Uh, you know how did you get into uh, into game development in the first place? Sure. Um, well, I've been doing it about twenty three years. Uh, I originally started in the music industry, so I was in radio, and then I was uh, working at a record company, and I did that for a while. And long story short, uh, I went to a pub with some friends, and our friends brought their next door neighbor who had nothing to do that day. And he turned out to be an executive producer (laughs) at a video game company. We hit it off. Um, He thought what I did was cool. I thought what he did was cool. Um, Ended up interviewing for a marketing and brand position um, with his company. And uh, halfway through the interview, they said, you should be a producer. I'm like, okay, I can do that. Not having any idea how to do that, but I did. So uh, yeah, did that for... uh, did that for a little while, a uh, company called Radical Entertainment. Um, then went over to EA, uh, EA Sports, did 10 years at EA Sports, worked on FIFA, World Cup, Champions League, and all the European stuff. Uh, enjoyed that, wanted to try something other than games. So I went to Microsoft. Uh, the, the game they hired me to make got canceled before I got there, so they put me on Connect Sports. So once again, in sports. Uh, did that for a while. Uh, did a small startup, tried that. It wasn't quite what I was looking for. Went to Capcom, uh, three and a half, four years at Capcom as the, the general manager of the studio and the COO, uh, and then ended up going back to EA. Uh, they called me back and I ended up going down to California, worked out of Maxis and was the VP of Maxis um, down at EA in California for four years and then uh, decided to come back home to Canada and Vancouver and, and start a company with a bunch of people that I had wanted to start a company with a long time ago. So that's in a, in a nutshell. Uh, cool. And... Um... I think um, you know with with Timber Games, you know you. Um, I think you described it to me once as uh, you know all dogs doing new tricks. I really like that. Um, can you uh, you know again you know backstory? You know how did you you know come together with your fellow founders? You sure. know get the first team started. I mean, why did you start it? Uh, I mean, it's all very exciting. Um- we wanted to make timber because we, you know, uh, it is, it's, you know, the, the partner Zoe and I and Jeff started the company um, uh, together. Uh, I've known Zoe for a long time. I've known Jeff for a long time. And we've both been at AAA studios and we both kind of wanted to get back to the craft of making games, get a little bit closer to the team because um, we've all worked at these mega corporations. But we also wanted to have fun doing it and try and do things a little bit differently. And, you know, certainly in Vancouver, uh, you've got a couple of big load-bearing walls. You've got Microsoft, which makes the coalition, uh, which has the coalition, which makes Gears of War, which is a massive operation. And you've got EA, which makes you know tons of games in Vancouver. And we wanted to be an alternative. You don't want to make a sports game. You don't want to make a shooter. Maybe you should give us a try. And so what we've been doing is trying to uh, work with a bunch of people that are like-minded, that we think can can make some really great products, AAA products, uh, PC console. And... Um, and 
and be very clear on the kind of products that we want to make and how we want to operate as a company and really focus on things like diversity uh, and inclusion. And people drop that buzzword all the time. But, um, you know, as of today, it appears to be working for us. We're 48 percent female in our studio um, oh. and uh, we didn't set a target number. We just wanted to be mindful of it. And that's working. Um, and uh, a group of people that that really worked well and communicated well with each other. So each one of us has a specific role and we complement each other. And uh, bringing in people that are that are kind of scrappy and uh, and have worked in other places that want to try something a little bit different. Uh, so literally, like you said, a bunch of old dogs doing new tricks. But we also got a whole pile of puppies too. So they're running around with us. <laughs> so you you touched upon uh, you know fun and I mean that's the um, the theme today. You know the secrets to um, to building a company culture of of you know fun. Um, I w- I would love to you know, to talk a lot about that because, yeah. you know, really feels like, you know, one which is, you know, easy said, you know, hard actually doing. Um, so how would, how would you break that down? I mean, and, and, you know, take your time, you know, think about this as a, you know, mini, you know, GDC speech, you know, it's, it's right. because I, I guess there's several components to this. So, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to cut you off too, too fast here. So, no, so no, no. like, how would you break it down and, you know, how, how do you approach that? Well, when you think about video games as a thing, people play them to have fun. And it's, it's a form of entertainment. And as you make something that is intended to give people some joy and, 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 and fun in their life, it only makes sense that the people making the game should probably have a fun process and a fun way of doing that. Uh, you know, we're not making accounting software. Uh, we're not making anything really, you know, really, really heavy. Um, and we try really not to be really stiff in what we're doing in, in making these games. So um, we have obviously when COVID hit and, you know, we're all fully remote right now while we wait for our office to get ready when we all eventually move back into the office next year. We had to really go uh, the extra mile in, in, in communicating and building a culture remotely with people. And there's a, there's a number of ways that we've done that. Um, a lot of people that know about Timbers have know us because we have kind of like a visual style. Uh, Jeff Coates, uh, who is the uh, creative director of the studio, he's also an incredibly talented um, illustrator. And he's the one that draws all the pictures of us. He draws all of us. And um, immediately we've got kind of a personality that people that don't even work for us kind of feel like they know us as a result of these, of these drawings. And what Jeff draws is actually legitimately the kind of weird stuff that happens day to day at Timber. Um, so we really need to lean into that and embrace that. And we try to sneak our values in there. We try to sneak in things that are very, very important, uh, to us. So when people, uh, when people want to know what's it, what it's like to work at Timber, we'll just look at all of our social media stuff. Cause that's kind of what it's like to work at Timber. So, um, we try to keep things light. Um, everyone has a voice. One of our values that we have is, uh, is clarity and clarity is a weird value. It's a re- it's a weird one to have. Um, but the reason we chose the word clarity was we want everyone that works with us and everyone that plays our products and, 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 and everything in between to be really understanding and clear what it is that we're doing and what is expected of them. And so if they have questions, they just ask. So no one is walking off into the forest going, I have no idea what the hell's going on, right? It's, it's, so we try to make sure we're really clear. And, you know, when we release our products, same thing. When you see the product, it'll be intuitive how to play it. I know what to do. I know where to go. And I know, uh, I know in, intuitively what I'm supposed to be doing in this product. And we found that if you make things really clear about what people are uh, expected to do, that actually really lightens things up. And they're not people kind of rubbing their hands going, oh, my God, am I doing the right thing? I don't know if I'm in the right place. We, we, we just focus on that. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, we have a lot of tools that we use. Um, we use Slack a lot. We use a lot of Slack. Um, and I'll give you an example of the, of the culture at Timber. Um, it started out over a fight about cilantro. Um, cilantro is one of these polarizing things. Some people hate it. Some people love it. And um, I noticed on Slack that we had a, a foodie channel and someone was talking about cilantro, yay or nay. And I thought, oh, I'm going to weigh in on this one because I, I love cilantro. And I said, uh, I, for one, I'm on Team Cilantro. And the Slack channel exploded. And we had, I actually looked it up. We had 326 comments about Cilantro, which turned into kimchi. And then it just went to Weird Town really fast. And it's indicative of the culture that we have. Um, 
we try to make it light. We try to have fun. We try to uh, keep topical. We try to com- over communicate with each other. Um, and I think that makes for better game making. You know, if we can have fun talking about, well, cilantro or product management software or, or anything, um, the game will end up being fun too. So we try to keep it light, focus on the personalities of the people at the studio and amplify that. Um, anyone can ask anybody anything in the company. It was weird. We have one individual that said to me, uh, I have a regular one-on-one with every, every member of the staff. And um, one of them said to me, this is super weird for me because the last company that I worked for, I worked there for like two to three years and I never once had a one-on-one with the head of the studio. And I think that's absurd. Um, you don't have to have one every week or even every month, but you should have a connection with the people that are tasked with running the studio. And so by, by keeping it relatively flat and keeping it open um, and consequence-free, uh, I think it makes for a better place. And, oh, and man, do we have fun. Like We usually are laughing ourselves sick most of the time. And yeah, we still make games. How, um, I mean, you mentioned that it's mostly remote, um, at least right now. Uh, I mean, firstly, do you, will you have a bit of a hybrid approach moving forward, even when the new office is ready? And, and secondly, uh, if so, um, how do you, you know, how do you see the difference building a culture when you know that everyone's going to be in the office versus building mm. a culture where you are, you know, fully or partly remote. And, and I guess, you know, I, I would also say, you know, how do you make sure that everyone feels included in that? Mm. So the ones who are maybe a little bit more remote doesn't feel like a satellite. Yeah. Um, so a couple of answers in there. <clears throat> uh, we are, when we do open the office, we're making it everybody's choice. Um, do you want to come to the office or not? What we find is everyone likes to throw the buzzword out there, hybrid, right? And hybrid means different things to different people. What I think is going to happen, <clears throat> we're going to have a number of people that are going to come to work and they're going to want to come to work every day. <clears throat> There's a number of people that don't want to come to work into the office at all and the ones that are in between. What I suspect will happen is the people that don't want to really want to come into the office very often, they're going to come in and they're going to feel like they're missing out because, you know, uh, you know people tend to love having human connection. Um, and I'm hoping that the the chemistry and the and the culture that we built remotely will kind of flood into the actual physical office. Uh, it takes effort. It takes time. It takes work to make people feel included and to make sure that everyone is understanding where we're going as a company when you're fully remote. Uh, we have people right across the country now working with us. Canada's pretty big. Um, you know, I remember a friend of mine from Germany who went came to the very first time to Canada. He goes, oh, my God. I flew over Canada for like six hours. (laughs) And he said, if I did that at home, I'd fly over 60 60 countries. And uh, we have people in Vancouver. um, And then we have people just on the outskirts of Vancouver. We have people in in Alberta, the next province over. We have people in Ontario. We have people in Montreal. We have people in Nova Scotia now. And so we really are kind of a a nationwide company. Time zones get in the way a little bit, a little bit. So we have to be flexible there. But... um, we, when we do big events, we bring everyone in, right? We're having a summer barbecue in a few weeks. Everyone is going to get flown in from uh, wherever they work at, uh, at Timber to join us. Same thing with the Christmas party. We will fly everybody in for this. Um, it's expensive, but the, uh, the benefit you get from people making that physical connection with people is, you know, you can't put a price on that because people just love it. Um, and then it's all the incentive, all the things that we do. We try to do a lot of social things. We have, uh, you know, every every other Friday or so, we are, we're always there's always a game thing going on um, that we're all playing together, or we're having some kind of social meetup. Uh, we're doing social meetup on Friday. Um, one of the guys who is from Ontario is out for a wedding, and we thought, okay, we're going to capitalize this. One of our guys is out. We're going to have a party, and so we're going to do something on Friday. Um, so we try to plan events, and we try to find uh, find ways that we can um, let people join us. Some people can't. And uh, some people don't feel comfortable with COVID going out to a, like a, a big, a big crowded place. So every single event that we do, we have an online option so they can join us. Whether it's literally, I brought my iPad to a to a dinner party one time, so some of the people that wanted to join us could sit at the end of the table on the iPad and feel like they were with us. Um, it looked stupid to the other people having dinner, but I don't care. Um, it was great, and uh, you have to go that extra mile to to make people feel included. So a slightly different question that I think is, you know, any any kind of company leader has to think about is, you know, how to do with um, 
you know, with, with titles. Um, you know, some companies, they are like, well, we don't really care about titles. You know, everyone's just a team member. Um, you know, some come up with, let's say, more, you know, funny names or, you know, they can like reinvent a lot of titles. And, and then some have uh, almost like a gamification. So it's, it has a very, very clear kind of structures. It's almost like, you know, leveling up in a game. Um, you know, what's, uh, what's your approach to it? Um, that, that's a super interesting question. Uh, I've a lot, I have a few thoughts on that. So, uh, I like people to, uh, have the title that accurately describes what it is they do, but I'm also mindful that there are some people that are working for timber that may not be working for timber a few years from now. They may want to want, want to go off and do other things. I want them to have an identifiable title and an identifiable role should they decide to move move on elsewhere and same thing for people coming in right uh you know producer is one of the most thrown around terms in the world right there are all kinds of producers depends if you work at microsoft you're this kind of a producer you work at ea you're that kind of a producer um so we try to make sure we've got a little bit of consistency uh in in what in what it is that we do um we try to keep the the titles accurate but how they actually uh frame themselves is, is their choice so um there's a bunch of new terms that are coming out now, like game director. A lot of people don't know what game directors were. And game directors were like a natural evolution of, um, of a couple of roles coming together and, and kind of uh, achieving, achieving a, a need. Um, we have principal artists and principal engineers. And before that, it was like, well, that, those were the only principal kind of thing would only come up if you were looking we're working in a super heavy tech company. Uh, um, the leveling, we try to be consistent with our parent company, which is Sumo, based in the UK. Um, there are, are there are a number of levels, and everyone kind of categorizes into a, a level a level system, uh, so you know exactly where you stand. Um, and then there are like three different levels of each level. So let's say there's ten levels, and you, you know, are you are you like uh, one, two, three in each one of those levels? So you are learning, you are performing, or you're exceeding. And it it, it helps people plan their career. It's like, hey, well, I'm doing this. I'm at the midpoint of my of this level. What do I need to get to the next stage? And we have very clear ways um, that you can get there. And we communicate those things. We call it pathways. It's something that we've been doing with Sumo. Um, and, and we're very excited because uh, we're the new kids in, in, in Canada uh, uh, that is a part of the Sumo network. And so they're, they're really uh, very open-minded and, and reaching out to us. Hey, how would you like to kind of help us frame this journey together? And part of that has been talking about the levels and the titles. Uh, everyone wants to know, how, to, how do I go from here to here? How can I get from here to here? And we try to make it as transparent as possible. Um, so everybody knows. And there's no ambiguity and no just, nah, how am I going to build my career? In fact, I would say probably one of the big motivators that people have joined Timber, uh, uh, for, for joining Timber, has been they've been working at a company and they don't have a path, they don't have a plan, they don't know what their career progression is, and they don't know how to build it. So they've come to us, and we do our very best effort to say, we will give you a, a path, and then together we will plan that journey. Uh, and man, have we found some amazing, amazing people um, that have joined us that were just being, I mean, I'll, I'll say, taken advantage of. For, they were super skilled and not being paid very much and uh, been doing all this work. And we found them, we brought them in, and we went, wow, they're <laughs> way better than we thought. And their path just takes off. And, uh, man, that, that's super rewarding to see. I think that's very interesting. I mean, sometimes I come across, you know, places where, um, you know, they might be making a game where, where you know, kind of succession is extremely, um, or path maybe i should say it's extremely clear and 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 well thought through but then when we talk about how that works internally they're like no we don't care about titles um right which always strikes me as you know it's one of those things that might sound cool to say but it creates a lot of problems in 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 practice um and i you know i like what you say because you know in the beginning of this talk you know you, you talked about the value of you know clarity so you know, if you're going to actually live up to that value, well, then you need to have clarity on these kind of things too. Yeah, you know, we're a video game company and we hire people to do the work that we need to get done to make the video game. But we're also mindful that people have choices, right? We have to earn your respect and your commitment to be part of our journey. Because 
if you make video games in Vancouver, you got like a thousand companies you can work for. There's tons of work in this city. So we need to make sure that we are offering something that other studios aren't. You know, um, we pay well. We're super competitive on pay. We have great benefits. We have a lot of things that we do that other companies don't do. But we also really need to understand and respect the fact that people are entrusting us with their time and their effort and their career. We need to honor that and we need to help them get on the journey where they're going. Um, Sometimes that journey will be, maybe they're just passing through. Maybe they're just going to be a timber for a little while to get to where they really want to want to be or, 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 or to help them understand where they want to go. Um, and we will help you on that journey. We will celebrate the time that you've had with us. Sometimes people come on and they're like, man, I'm never leaving. We love that too. Um, so it's important that we earn that trust. It's important that we earn that relationship that we have with all of our employees. So, you know, if someone, you know, I've been, I've been doing um, a podcast before when I've been asking a producer, you know, what would you recommend to someone who's, you know, thinking about doing that career path? But let's say we take this now one, le one level up, you know, let's say someone who's considering, um, you know, I, I want to start a game company or, you know, I want to lead a game company. So we take it to the, to the executive level. I mean, what... Um, you know, I have, I have one f friend that comes to mind that, you know, he's, you know, he did an MBA and then he was working for a very famous telecom company in Sweden. And, and then he, he, you know, became studio head of, of a good studio and he, he brought that to great success. And, you know, he's, he's still in the game industry because, you know, he found that to be way more fun than, you know, hmm. any other industry he's been in. But obviously he kind of came in already from the beginning at a relatively high level. And my prediction is that we're going to see more of that in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, people that are already very accomplished um, yep. company leaders, and they realize that this is just a very, very interesting industry for, you know, financial reasons, where the market is going. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, there's a long list, right? Mm -hmm. So, so let's say, you know, if, if you would speak to, let's say, both the person who uh, might be very junior, but are basically aspiring to do something similar to what you're doing in the future, uh, but, but also to the person who maybe are coming, let's say, a little bit more from the outside and is already quite a, accomplished and, and are thinking about moving into this industry. I mean, what, mm. you know, what, what kind of career advice would you, would you give? Uh, for the junior people that are coming in that are relatively green and looking to understand, I just say uh, it's 90% who you know. Um, to find your way in and you need to network, network, network and make yourself known, uh, you know, use LinkedIn, um, hit people up on LinkedIn, but be honest with why you're asking to be LinkedIn. Don't be just some random person that sends a form letter or something that has nothing to do with what your business is and tries to link in with you. Um, be honest, um, reach out and ask people, Hey, I'll, uh, can I take you for a cup of coffee? I'd like to learn about stuff. I did that. And I made a commitment that you know, all the people that said yes to me when I was thinking about doing this, that I reached out to my peers and friends that I had great advice, reach out and talk to people and ask them questions. Uh, do, do your research on, on, what, on what it is about games. You know, people think, oh, yeah, the video game company, we sit around and play games all day and eat, eat chips. Um, and uh, there's a lot of hard work that goes into making games and a lot of stress that goes into making games. Making entertainment software is hard because it, it, it's hard physically um, to make sure you get the algorithms right and you're getting the right camera and the right presentation, the right modeling, the right rendering, the right frame rate, all that kind of stuff that comes into play. But um, but understanding that uh, your imagination is going to take you further than your education. Um, you know, I, I, a long time ago, I wrote an article that said your, your, um, your personality is more important than your resume. And I stand by that. Um, there's a lot of people that have not had massive educations that have come uh, come on board and, and been amazing because they have the right brain, they have the right attitude, and they're ready to learn. So for the younger people, the people that are more junior, and I don't want to say younger people, I'll say the greener people because I don't care if you're 45 years old, you want to do a career change, you've never done games, sure, let's talk um, because we've all been there. Um, for the people that you talk about, like the MBA people, or the, the, you know, the, the, the school smart people and, and that have been perhaps in another industry that want to take the leap over, um, just get comfortable with being uncomfortable, get comfortable with everything being unpredictable because um, games are, uh, are, are very volatile. They, they kind of change at an instant's notice. And, and, you know, you'll go, you'll, you'll talk to someone in charge of the product or a publisher and say, Ta -da, we've done this. He goes, oh, that's really great. But I was really hoping we could change it over to that thing now. And I'm like, well, you never told us. I'm like, can I just get that? And I'm like, 
yeah, it's going to take time. Why does it take so long? And it's like all that crap you have to go through. Um, I actually think it's really great when you bring people in from different industries. Um, we have an engineer that works with us that has never made a video game in his life. Um, and he's a great engineer and he has come from the movie industry. And he, he's an amazing software engineer. And he brings with us the thinking uh, that is different for us and, and, and offers us insight into things that we hadn't considered. Um, and uh, I'm a big fan of hybrid roles for people to come in that are really good at one thing, but they want to learn about something else. We'll become like a multi-class person, be somebody that could do more than one thing. Um, but I love it when people join from other, for, uh, from other industries. It doesn't always work. And it usually, I think, doesn't work because they don't have the right mindset to be vulnerable and to be okay being wrong. Um, you know, uh, I look back at my career when I first started in video games and I thought I'd do everything when I got to EA. And boy, was that a steep learning curve. Because I, I came from a company where I was like the head of a product. And then I joined EA because I really wanted to. And I went, wow, I thought I was way better than I am. And I had to kind of take a, take a step and do, okay, I, I really need to learn how to do this now and committed to doing it. And so someone coming in from a high powered position that is going to join a different industry, it's going to be a learning curve. It's, it's going to take time and you have to be okay with that. You have to be okay being wrong. Um, you have to leave your ego at the door because man, nothing is worse than coming in and thinking, you know, everything and have a bunch of people that are like 25 years younger than you going, you're an idiot. <laughs> you need to be okay with that because you might be an idiot. It's just how you flex into that new role that that, that that matters but really have an open mind and 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 listen to people um uh and and you know one you know something that we do at timber which i think is awesome we share our goals with each other like really share our goals um everyone said oh what's your yearly goals and what do you what are you going to do and then you know people think oh, okay and then at the end of the year i'm going to get some review and they're going to tell me was i doing well or not doing well and then it's going to be a happy day or a bad day we don't like that plan um, we like to have regular check-ins, quarterly reviews um, with your manager that kind of talk about how are you doing, how are things going. Um, but we took this kind of bold step of sharing our goals, warts and all, like everything. Um, uh, and right up to the executive level, um, myself and uh, the other uh, exec leaders at, at Timber, we shared all of our goals directly with every single person on the staff. So they know exactly what it is that we're trying to do, right down to our personal goals. And that can be terrifying. You know, I wrote down lots of stuff personally that I wanted to be held accountable for. It's like, you know, um, I need to listen more and talk less. And uh, I asked my team to hold me accountable to that. And I think by being vulnerable, by sharing my goals, my personal goals with the entire team, I think that buys a little bit of, um, buys a connection that they can have that I'm not some stone pillar in the corner that is unassailable and you can't ask questions. I want to be completely open and honest because I'm not great at lots of stuff. Uh, I tell people all the time, I'm actually not very good at making games, um, but I'm pretty good at putting good teams together that do make good games. And that's what I take my greatest joy in doing. I think many of the things you're saying would also be applicable to people that are already in a kind of studio or publisher executive role. Um, you know, one thing which is interesting here is that um, uh, um, I shouldn't say exactly which publisher, but I was explained once that at this particular publisher, when you reach a certain level, it's like this, uh, what do you call it? Jet wind? Jet? Um, yep. Uh, jet stream? Jet stream it's yep. called. Uh, it's like it's like this jet stream of like politics that hits you, you know? It's like, you know, as long as you're at the studio, it's like, it's fine. It's about the game. And then you reach that certain level of title and then like the, the jet stream hits you, you know? yeah and um and, and i guess you know as an executive you always have to make you know uh, tough decisions from time to time but you know um so far you know i i um you know you're, you're definitely one of the, the the people i know that when your name comes up i hear you know you know it's one of those who be like yeah you know i know that person you know and i think it also reflects a little bit in your social media i saw this this kind of like you know Joe's hundred that you're doing. Um, mm. That's really cool. Uh, what was the background to you starting that? Um, so you probably uh, need to I, say what it is, by the way, for the for the listeners. Yeah, okay. Who, who, yeah. Um, so I did. I do a thing on LinkedIn that I started doing because um, it's called Joe's Impact 100. And I I was talking with a friend of mine. I said, God, you know, 
LinkedIn is really great and it can really suck at the same time. Sometimes people can just put so much garbage on there and you have to wade through so much crap on LinkedIn um, to get to anything that's interesting. And I thought, I really want to take my privilege of which I am well aware I have, like I'm a six foot five white guy <laughs> um, in, in, in an industry full of us um, with a beard and that's kind of key. Um, there you do, you have one too. Um, and, uh, I thought I have been so fortunate and I have, uh, I, it's not really giving back, but I just want to kind of call out some of the people that helped get me to where I am. And I'm really appreciative of that. So I thought, I wonder if I can come up with 50 people that I know that have really helped me. And when I started, I sat down and I just started listing out all the people that I, that I thought that, that had done that. I was already at 75 and I thought, oh my God, I could totally do a hundred. So I wanted to do a, uh, a list of 100 people that I thought uh, that, that really impacted my career and, and, and kind of thank them, but also give little insight and little stories on some of the, 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 the interactions I've had with people because there's lots of hilarious interactions I've had with people. And I wanted to kind of shout that out. And man, that's been huge. It's been like people have been sending me uh, messages. They said, oh my God, I was like, I'm having a really lousy day and I read this article, this thing that you did and it's been a bright spot for me and I, pre I appreciate that. And I didn't do it for like uh, patting myself on the back. I just really wanted to highlight some of the great people that I've worked with because I think some people need some people need a spotlight or a shout out from other people in public sometimes. Um, so that's why I did that. And it's been, it's been super fun. I'm up to 46 now. I've got another, uh, another few to go before I hit my 100 and I'll do it by the end of the year. Um, and so I have to balance, talk about my hundred, um, cause that's a personal thing for me. Talk about someone we just hired at Timber and show a comic of what they've done. Show, uh, show something amazing that Jeff has drawn in terms of what our revision and values are. And kind of, I try to balance my relationship with that, with that platform. So that's kind of what that's about. It's, it, it's really cool. I, I hope that if anyone listening right now that, uh, you know, steals that idea from you, that you're okay with that because. I'm totally okay with that. Yeah, personally, I would love to see more people do something like that because, you know, as you say, you know, a lot of the stuff that you see on social media, including LinkedIn, is you know might be not that, let's say, valuable. But but you know, these kind of things are, you know, it, it's really interesting to read. You know, it, it, it's 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 quality quality reading, and it, and you also creates, um, you know, you kind of hit 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 many birds with one stone there because every time I read one of your stories, I feel like I get to know you a little bit better without mm. actually meeting you or talking with you. But I also I also feel like I'm starting to get someone else a little bit, you know. It, it, yeah. It's it's uh, it, it's it's like a, this double thing, you know, which is very powerful. Yeah, people have a people have a um, a persona that they like to, to to share, and sometimes there's a really great story behind that persona that people don't know, and that's what I've been trying to call out with some of the people that have helped me on my journey, and some of the people that I've worked with that have really appreciated. And yes, there's some like you know there's some funny stuff in there too that I think is the stuff that people remember. Um, and it's 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 putting more oh there goes the dog <laughs> um, it's putting more humanity behind these faceless people that um, that are in the industry and I think that's really important I've had people that have reached out and said hey are you cool if I rip you off and do the same thing I'm like of course you can do whatever you want um, and saying that they have found it um, it's given them the courage to actually talk about that kind of stuff too. And one, you know, a couple of people in particular reached out and said, I'm going to do the same thing. Are you cool with that? And it's like, of course I'm cool with it because I didn't do it. I didn't do it to get business or pat myself on the back. I did it because I just really wanted to get some shout outs out there to say, hey, all these people that helped me, thanks for helping me get there. And it's, I think it's important to do. All right. It's, it's a really cool idea. So I have a I have a final question. I I, I would mm -hmm. like to you know pick your brain a bit on a let's say more long term you know visionary thing, and and I would actually like to start um, in a in a in a quote by uh, you know your your fellow you know founder Zoe uh, that I also did an amazing podcast with you know some time ago, and she was doing a speech at GDC, and she had one slide which you know obviously for for me who's in in tools you know really liked, and she said. You know, you need to recognize the cultural impact of tools. Um, I, yeah. I might have misquoted that slightly, but but that was you know basically the gist. You, know, you, sure. you need to recognize the cultural impact of your tool choices. Yeah. And, and obviously, you know, I like that a lot because it resonates with a lot of the ideas. You know, why we created you know favor in the first place. But here's the question, you know, for you, um, since we are now in a world where much more of the the office 
is really online rather than, let's say, the physical space. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, it kind of moved there a bit. Uh, do you think that we will see much more, let's say, um, you know, dis- distinctive designs that, that are, let's say, culturally connected? Um, w- what I'm after a little bit here is that, I mean, obviously we can talk about tools like Favor that, you know, maybe in the future right. it would not only be, let's say, Favor versus, let's say, more centralized tool. Maybe it will be a lot of different flavors but, but but I think we can maybe think about this much wider, you know, um, you know, communication tools. I mean, today we tend to talk about it most. Let's say we talk about social media. We tend to mostly talk about, let's say, age categories. And OK, well, right. Facebook is now starting to become for us who's a little bit older versus, you know, TikTok would definitely be, let's say, a little bit younger demographic, etc. So that's like yep. an age dimension. But but maybe maybe do you think that we will get even also with business tools like more distinct, mm-hmm. let's say, cultural you know, tools. It's like, you know, you're going to, you're going to pick the tool because you're going to say, well, you know, you know, we're really trying to have this kind of culture and then we're going to pick that instead of talking about features all the time. I think so. So I'll give you a quote for Favro you can put in your back pocket because I've described Favro as the tofu of planning ops apps. Um, And I I call it, (laughs) I call, I call it the tofu of planning apps because um, when you throw tofu in, in something you're cooking, it absorbs the flavor. It absorbs what it is thrown into. We, you know, we looked at lots of different software. And when we looked at Favro, we thought, you know, if we can make Favro feel like it's ours. We can make it feel like our own. Um, and that's why we use it. And I am a hard nut to crack when it comes to using this stuff. As Zoe will tell you, you know, um, you know when we were uh, launching it to the team, she goes, even Joe's using it. <laughs> so... Um, it's. It, I think if you if you if you give people the customization option to make it really feel like it's their it's their application, right? I you know and I, I use it all the time, and the way that I uh, need to remember things and highlight things, I always have to put a picture on all my cards, and and those pictures that you see when you open up Favro and you go, okay, there's the Princess Bride guy who says inconceivable, and I use that guy because I wanted to draw attention to this particular thing we're trying to figure out, and so all of these different things that we've done. Have allowed us to make it for make it feel like our own, um, and that's why we use it. Um, but I think you'll find that most of the I think a lot of the software that that people use uh, they they want to make it it has to feel like you made this for my company. You know, we're looking at performance management uh, software, deciding which one to use, and we've had conversations with probably half a dozen companies that all make kind of the same thing. But what sets one or two of them apart is. Do you integrate with the things that I use? We use Slack all the time. We don't use email very much anymore. We use Slack for most things. Does it integrate with Slack? Um, can I customize it? Um, if uh, you know, can I go in there and put my own fields in there, and I can customize what I want to be measured on? I want to, what I want to roll out to the team. And I think that's what's going to happen in the future. I think that companies are still going to have their offering, but I think they have to offer kind of a framework that they say, "Here's what we make." Um, Here's how you can customize it. It's almost like ordering a car, right? You can order you can order a Volkswagen or an Audi. They're basically the same thing at the very core, but then the engineering stuff that kicks off and you know the Audi is you know higher in components and it's meant more for performance and you can add more stuff, but they all come right down to that engine on a, on a frame. Um, and so it's I believe that the software and the services that we're going to see coming from the marketplace are going to do that. They're going to be flexible. Um, uh, and listen to the consumer. You know, um, you know, I'm talking to you. Uh, you have been very good at listening to our feedback. Uh, you know, we 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 think of you as our as our as our friend and partner at Favro, not just somebody we write a check to every month. Um, and you know, for example, one, you know, as you know, as you know, um, one of our guys in our QA department said, "Oh, I really wish Favro could do this kind of stuff." Um, and he gave you the feedback and some of the stuff is already in now working and we're using it. And so, the, you know, it's that relationship from a vendor. So if you can make software that does X for me and it makes my life easier, I love it. But if you could take it that next level and you could make it that I can make it feel like my own, I can customize it. So it's bespoke for me. That's what I think the future is. Now, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, um, also besides, you know, some of the things you mentioned, I think there's a couple of things coming up that we're working on that will, um, you know, will make you very happy. Awesome. Um, the only the big struggle we have is the the Swedish um, summer vacation thing. You know, like, like this country dies for for the summer. You know, um, 
fortunately, we have developers in many other parts of, yep. of Europe and the world. So, so we as a company doesn't shut down. So no one worry. But, uh, but, but it's uh, of course we do have um, uh, you know we are a Swedish company, and 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 some of our you know uh, core design you know comes from well, you know people that are here, and 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 uh, we have this like uh, you know interesting you know su- sum- summer period. So. Um, you will you will basically get a bit of a ping uh, from me, you know, when we get back to fall, and you know, we we have a bit of workshopping to do. And you know, I, as a comment, then you know, to what you say said, you know, I think what what you know, as you know, I built another tools company before, and you know, one of the things I learned is, is that um, customers will always have a lot of suggestions for how to improve, uh, but the most important thing is to always use those suggestions as an opportunity to ask about the problem they want to solve. Because if you can deeply understand the underlying problem, you can typically come up with a design that will make the tool better for everyone and not just, you know, bloat it with like one more button that, you know, ultimately will make the tool totally bloated and no one wants to use it in Jira, you know, so, so it's, 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 it's very, you know, um, it, you need to have that mindset because if you're going to build a, you know, a, a, a tool, which actually becomes easier and easier to use as it becomes more capable. Um, I, th- I think actually car metaphor is pretty good here. I mean, you used a car metaphor. I think we can use a car metaphor here that, I mean, you know, driving a high performance sports car today is actually much easier than driving a high performance sports car, you know, 20 years ago. I mean, absolutely. if you would drive, you know, like the, the fastest Ferrari in the eighties, you would you know, probably drive it off the road. Versus well, today, you know, an you know, example, it, like I used to have a, I had a 20 year old sports car um, and it was, or no, was it 20 years? No, it was about, no, it wasn't that long. It was about 15 years old at the most. Manual transmission with a clutch that was so hard. It was just like, oh my God, the clutch was so hard to use. Um, and uh, it was super fun to drive. And all of a sudden now uh, advancements in transmissions, it's not just like a crappy automatic transmission that comes through. It's like a PDK system or a double clutch system. Those things are awesome. And there's a whole generation of people that are going to grow up not knowing how to, not knowing the sound of grinding gears as you're trying to get it in there or, or, or burning out your clutch because you're, you're too hard on it. Um, and it's because uh, the advancements of technology and that, that, you know, that manual clutch that I used to drive that was a brute to shift. Um, uh, as, as you move forward, I can get the same performance and it's way easier now from, a, from like a PDK or a, uh, a double clutch system. Um, still super enjoyable to drive. It's evolved, and it's just what you're saying. Like you have to evolve um, what the needs are of the people, uh, and and listen to them. And as you and as you said as well, Patrick, um, it's tell me what problem you're trying to solve. Don't tell me what you think you need us to do. Right? You know, I learned a long time ago from an engineer. I was saying to an uh, he taught me a lot um, when I was working at EA. We wanted a 3D front end from our game, a 3D menu system because everyone was doing it. And I had this huge argument with an engineer saying, I run a 3D front end. And he was saying, we couldn't do it. Can't be done. Can't be done. And I'm like, but those guys are doing it. It can be done. He goes, yeah, we can't do it. It can't be done. And then I realized the way that I was asking the question was not the right way to ask a question. My technical director came to me and said, you know, I can make that look exactly 3D and it'll feel 3D. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, but it won't be 3D. I'm like, well, that's what I want. What's the difference? He said, if you tell a, a certain kind of an engineer you want a three-dimensional front end they'll start building you a three-dimensional world as a menu system and that's not what you want so he said that's why they can't do that because they don't have enough memory i'm like ah. come to them with a problem can you make it do this yeah we'll make it do this don't tell someone how to make it tell them the problem you're trying to solve and that's exactly what you just said that's uh that's awesome and um you know, I think we could continue to talk for um for a very very long time, um, and then it would turn into like a, you know, Joe Rogan then everyone uh, would know, be three, three hour you know podcast. No, it would be awesome. It would be awesome. But I think you know my um, my team um, are going to ping me soon, saying like this is yep. we're getting into the sequel now. So I hope I hope there will be a chance for a sequel in in a not too distant future. If that's okay with you, you. bet. I right, love that. That would be, that, would, that would be awesome. Some of my favorite podcasts. Podcasters, you know, they tend to have some, you know, reoccurring guests, and and that's nice yep. because they typically they start a little bit about what they talked about last time, and they move into some, you know, you know, latest and and, and greatest, um, you know. So so with that said, you know, you know, super thank to you, and you know, thanks to all of you for listening, and um, 
you know, as always, if you thought this was good, you know, please say share, you know, like, you know, you know what to do. And I'll see you in the next one. I hope you enjoyed that interview. I certainly did. If you want to elevate yourself as a modern leader and help your teams become even more successful, then check out Favor Academy at favor.com. They will find podcasts, webinars, articles, all free of charge. Check it out.